it's from Jesus, not surprisingly, that we find one of the most enlightening passages in the scripture regarding drinking alcohol. Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. This is Real Science Radio. I'm Fred Williams. And I'm Doug McBurney, Bible student, science geek, amateur comedian. Fred, it is great to be back with you talking about real science on Friday. So last week, we introduced our audience to the topic of alcohol consumption, and we looked at it from a scientific point of view. We lightly touched on scripture and how it impacts this conversation. So today, Doug, we wanted to wrap up with a few minor things left that we wanted to talk about, about the scientific aspect, but then we wanted to get to the primary barometer of truth, and that's the Bible. What does the Bible have to say about drinking alcohol? Yes, yes, indeed. Let's do that, Fred. But first, don't forget, everyone's on the edge of their seat for the interesting fact of the week. Oh, all right. Let's do it. So here is the interesting fact of the week. What does it mean if a wine is described as hot? Hot? A hot wine. What is a hot wine? Okay, now, I, I already told you that I'm not a wine guy, so I'm going to yeah. say that that means, I'm going to guess that that means it's tart. Let's do it again. Tart. <laughs> nope. It's higher content of alcohol. It's high in alcohol. Oh, is that right? Yeah, do you happen to know what non-vintage means as a bonus question? What is a non-vintage uh, non- wine? Non-vintage yeah. uh, means they didn't keep track of what year they made it. Yeah. Oh, Good no way. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's that's not like, from a, like, I'm going to give you that one because it's not from a single year, but from multiple wait. years. So you're pretty much okay. right. Okay. That's, okay, that's so a great, that's like, uh, great uh, answer, Doug. So that's like Mogan David. So one out of two one ain't of the, bad. There you go. Okay. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, I, I did hear about, I did hear there was political activity around banning what they call fortified wine. I've, I never heard it called hot, but I heard it called fortified. And there's uh, like Mogan David, there's the really cheap wine at the liquor store that's right up front and in the bottom. And it's instead of the normal whatever wine is, the normal alcohol, it's like double or triple that alcohol content, and it's literally marketed to vagrants and bums. <laughs> okay, so back to the topic of alcohol. I want to replay Dr. Andrew Huberman's summary points on alcohol from the last show in case you missed it. I definitely highly recommend you go back and watch that show. It was a lot of fun and a lot of interesting things, a lot of things that you probably didn't know about, some real eye-openers. So let's watch a summary of these uh Effects of alcohol, basically, Doug, that persist even when you're not drinking. If people are ingesting alcohol chronically, even if it's not every night, there are well-recognized changes in neural circuits. There are well-recognized changes in neurochemistry within the brain. And there are well-recognized changes in the brain-to-body stress system that generally point in three directions. Increased stress when people are not drinking diminished mood and feelings of well-being when people are not drinking. And as you'll soon learn, changes in the neural circuitry that cause people to want to drink even more in order to get just back to baseline or the place that they were in terms of their stress modulation and in terms of their feelings of mood before they ever started drinking in the first place. So to reiterate the high points from Dr. Huberman's podcast, For me, it boiled down to four things to watch out for with alcohol, especially if you're this chronic drinker. So you're drinking between 7 and 14 a week, which is really a lot of people we know. It could be one drink a night. It could be just three or four drinks on Saturday and Sunday night, whatever it is, if you're averaging seven a week. And so there's four high points again for me, and this is all besides the drinking way too much and driving impaired, killing people, killing yourself, all those other things. This is aside from that. So the following items persist. And here's the key, even when you're not drinking, in between those periods of time you ha- you were drinking uh, your wine or your uh, can of beer or whatever, 
So one, you have reduced inhibition, so you're less tactful. You have more impulsive behavior when you're not drinking. Diminished baseline of serotonin, which means your mood is slightly worse when not drinking. And so you basically pay the piper later. You have increased baseline of cortisol, which uh, impacts our stress level. It's a hormone that God designed to help us deal with stress. When you're not drinking, you'll have increased level of stress and anxiety. Again, pay the piper later. And then finally, four, he went into the destruction of good bacteria in your gut. And this is even if you have just one beer on the weekend. So even if you're just a very low, uh, be low to moderate drinker, you're going to kill the good bacteria in your gut. And you're going to yeah. allow a mechanism where it allows some of the bad bacteria to get into your system. So these right. were the four points, Doug, the highlights of that last show we did that I'd encourage people to go back and watch if you haven't had a chance. But that's kind of a summary of some of the eye-opening things that alcohol do after you've had your beer and then you're at work the next day, the day after and the day after, and you, you're, you have slightly elevated levels of mood, stress, yeah. things like that. And then you've, you, you know, then you maybe have your beer later because you want to relieve the stress and you're, maybe you're down or whatever your mood and you want to feel happy. Well, guess what? You're going to pay the piper later. Mm -hmm. So it, it was real interesting. Yeah. Well, what, what stuck out to me, Fred, was this idea of uh, craving and then eventually needing more and more alcohol. I mean, we associate behavior like that with like a heroin addict. You know, you start with just a tiny little bit of heroin and then it, you have to get more and more just to get back to baseline. You know, the, the, the heroin addict says if they can't get heroin, they're sick. And they just want to get well, you know, so they're just trying to get back to. And, and mm -hmm. Dr. Huberman gives a lot of really interesting and, and fairly persuasive uh, information that something like that happens to people who even just drink a few drinks uh, 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 during the week or, 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 or over the weekend. So that was an eye opener for me. Wow. That was interesting yeah. stuff. Yeah. And so uh, but now now let's go to this uh, NIH study, because isn't uh isn't uh, NIH, is uh, uh, Anthony Fauci still uh, 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 associated with the NIH? Maybe not officially. Talk about a guy who'll drive you to drink for crying out loud. But we're going to go, we're going to go ahead and quote the NIH, uh, the study that has a little bit more favorable outlook. Um, it's titled Moderate Wine Consumption and Health, um, a Narrative Review. And I'll give you a little bit of summary information from this study. There's a, there's a, a strong scientific consensus, for whatever that's worth, that uh, alcohol drinking can cause a dose-related increase of cancer risk. Um, clear patterns have emerged between alcohol consumption and the development of cancer of head and neck, esophagus, liver, breast, colon, and rectum. Oh, man. It, it seems like there's a huge scientific consensus that the more you drink, the, there's a proportionate level of increase of cancer risk. Right, right, yeah. So definitely, everybody's in definitely. agreement dose on that. Dose-related. Yep. Yeah, dose-related. Yeah, good point, good. Um, and then uh, resveratrol found in grapes and red wine uh, does not lower the risk of cancer. Uh, high consumption of alcoholic beverages as well as complete abstention as well as complete abstention, increase the risk of dementia, while light to moderate yeah. alcohol drinking may be associated with a decreased risk of dementia and Alzheimer's. Wow. And Doug, it talked about we need to pay particular attention to young people. The Global Burden of Disease Analysis estimates that for young adults aged 15 to 39 years, alcohol consumption has zero health benefits, none, nada not even drinking wine. That's according to the NIH study. So, in fact, they say alcohol is the leading risk factor for premature mortality and disability among those aged 15 to 49. The leading risk factor, according to the study, and it counts for 10% of all deaths in the age group 15 to 39. So, and, you know, on that same thing about age, moderate intake, especially during meals, might be a low-risk model, this paper says, but only for people over the age of 40. 
So for, for people of this age group, moderate alcohol intake may provide some health benefits. You know, I'm always suspicious, Doug, when I hear the word may in any kind of scientific paper from the evolutionists or secular science, it may do this, it may <laughs> yeah, do that. Yeah. So in this case, they're, you know, hedging their bets. It says may provide some health benefits such as reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, and diabetes, but also a possible increased risk of other diseases. And so one of the points I found when looking at all the podcasts and reading up on this, for drinking low to moderate amounts of alcohol, there could, it sounds like there's a slight beneficial decrease in some of these diseases such as, you know, diabetes and Alzheimer's, dementia. But a lot of these also say, but you have to realize you could have an increased risk of cancer. So which is, you know, where does this all shake out? Um, which is better? You know, you're going to avoid yeah. one for the other. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the old, the old six of one, half a dozen of the other. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So th there's definitely, a, yeah, th th there's, a, there's not really a slam dunk consensus. Um, uh, but it does seem to me, based on the research I've been able to do, that a little bit of wine is probably not that big a deal. Probably not bad for you at all. That's just my gut from looking at all the research and, yeah. and looking it around. And, and, and one more thing from the NIH study, so we'll finish this off. There's, uh, there's strong scientific evidence from Mediterranean and non-Mediterranean countries that moderate wine consumption increases longevity, reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease, and does not appreciably influence the overall risk of cancer. Um, even though it has to be underlined that not drinking alcohol apparently is better for cancer prevention overall. That's the NIH for whatever that's worth. So Doug, I also, I wanted to mention another study I found and merely by starting with the Bible, because I know that there's that verse in the Bible, you know, there's this guy named Paul, the apostle Paul, he tells Timothy to take a little wine for yes. his upset stomach, basically. So remembering that verse, I did a Google search for, is there uh, improved gut health when you drink wine? And sure enough, there an article popped right up. And this one is from the American Gastroenterological Association. So Doug, I'll rely on the audience to help me pronounce that. They can put it in the comments of the video, whatever. Well, that, that, it's not fair there because all I have to do is write it out. But I'm just going to say the American Gastroenterological <laughs> Association. <laughs> and this is what they wrote. that They have a title of an article that says, Is Red Wine Consumption Good for Your Intestinal Microbiome? And they say that it is. That red wine consumption does, in fact, have properties within it that improves your gut health when drinking red wine. Not, you know, okay. it, it, you can't be drinking uh -huh. like your, my Captain and Coke isn't going to help my, my gut biome. When I drink my Captain and uh, Coke, I got to follow okay. it up with sour right. It's yogurt. not going to help you uh, pronounce words like <laughs> gastroenterological. That's for sure. Oh, there that, you go. I'd love to see I think you try to pronounce that's that That's a good a... job. I think you nailed it, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to see you pronounce gastroenterological after a uh, uh, Captain and Coke. See yeah, if it helps or hurts. We can do our own, <laughs> do, yeah. do our own clinical study. <laughs> all right, so Fred, <laughs> after going through all this, we basically we have Dr. Huberman who advocates like no health benefits at all, even for wine. But you have other studies like the NIH review and the study from the Gastroenterological Association, where moderate consumption, particularly red wine, might have benefits. So there's some conflicting viewpoints, bottom line. Yeah. And so I think it's probably a good time to dive in to see what the Bible has to say, because there's a lot in the Bible about drinking alcohol. And we know, Doug, that the Bible is the ultimate arbiter of truth. We, this is where we're going to, everything in the Bible is true. It's reliable. If you have any questions about that, go watch uh, a lot of our shows or go back and watch the scientific evidence for the Bible that Domin Dominic Inyart and I did a while back. There's so much evidence to know that we can trust the Bible as true. So ultimately, Doug, everybody listening to our show or watching our show, we're hoping they can make an in informed decision based on all the science that we're presenting and science that's tentative. I mean, science, you know, a lot of this stuff, we don't know for sure 
if something's going to overturn it. A lot of these scientists argue with each other, especially on the, they're very contentious on this whole whether or not wine is healthy for you. There's one guy has one study, another scientist has another study, and they say, oh, you weren't taking this into account. The other guy goes, no, you, but you weren't taking this into account. So let's look at the Bible because that's what matters. And Doug, we mentioned on the last show that we're going to end our show today with RSR's recommended guidelines for alcohol. You know, you've got the CDC, you know, you've got other countries, they have their recommended uh, use of alcohol. They've got guidelines for how much alcohol you can drink. And so we'll have our own guidelines. RSR will provide the official RSR guidelines for consuming alcohol at the end of the show. And if, uh, you know, if if we're teaching something wrong, especially if it's like bad doctrine, that's worse than being drunk, honestly, to teach bad doctrine. So, you know, Paul warns actually more about uh, false teachers than he does about uh, wine and getting drunk. Uh, There's seven verses in Paul's epistles. Uh, about drunkenness, but there's nine for false teachers. And that was just based on the limited amount of research I was able to do getting ready for this show. But Paul definitely warns more about false teachers than he does about uh, going to the bar. So by that guide, you make a pretty good point, Fred. And to the audience, don't be shy if you think we need correction. We don't want to be saying anything that disagrees with the Bible. So uh, let's talk about wine in the Bible, Fred. Um, Uh, pretty much all wine in the times of the Bible uh, was at least incidentally alcoholic in that there was no refrigeration and there were no methods of sterile uh, storage that could prevent fermentation. So unless you drank the fruit of the vine relatively quickly, it would start to ferment and develop alcohol naturally. And and wine was commonly mixed with water. You know, I'm thinking there was no, there weren't these distilleries back in, you know, till long after Christ's earthly ministry. In other words, there wasn't, you know, we weren't in Tennessee. You know, I, I went to Nashville <laughs> here not, not too long ago. There's not oh, these yeah. distilleries. There was not widespread distillation of uh, alcohol until long no after liquor. Christ's time. So there's actually a, good case, Doug, to be made that when the Bible refers to wine and strong drink, which it does quite a few times, it's referring to two types of wine. One with little or no alcohol that fermented, incidentally, and was typically mixed with water, and strong wine, which is unmixed and fermented purposely to elevate the alcohol content and for flavor. So, you know, to ferment it, to make it hot, that was hot wine, Doug, because it has more alcohol in it. So, Doug, that reminds me of Revelation chapter 14, verse 10, where the angel warns anyone who takes the mark of the beast that they'll drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. The full wrath of God is compared to wine without mixture. Also, Fred, in Isaiah 25, 6, the scripture indicates the presence of wines that are fermented specifically for flavor and alcohol content. Isaiah 25, 6 reads, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, well refined. And, and I want to thank our producer, Dominic, for sending that over. Now, Dominic, for some reason, he preferred the ESV phrase, aged wine, well-refined, uh, in, instead of the King James, wines on the lees, well-refined. <laughs> so, and, and that's got to be a generational thing, because I was all excited, Fred, to go look up what on the lees meant, because I had no idea what that meant. And that's one of the fun things I find in the, in the old King James is you get these phrases and you're like, what in the world is that? And you go look it up. Well, it turns out on the lees means purposely left fermenting over its dregs. So basically what I'm trying to say, Fred, is that the way the scripture is written indicates that people would have recognized this idea that some wine was made strong and then there was other wine that was just wine. And so... So there was that kind of wine back then, 
uh, the, the strong, intentional, uh, purposely made wine. And then there was the more, the more accidental fermentation of grape juice and other juices, Fred, that it simply ke- couldn't be avoided due to chemistry and nature. And, and that type of wine, it seems, was typically mixed with water. Yeah, because we know the water quality in the ancient Middle East wasn't what it is now in America, for example. And, you know, I, of course, you know, we're talking outside of, say, Flint, Michigan, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so they have basically lousy water that they were mixing with lousy wine. <laughs> and, you know, it makes sense that the alcohol, and Dr. Huberman talked about how alcohol does clean or wipe out bacteria, that right. this alcohol cleans up the bugs in the juice and the water cut that nasty flavor of that cheap wine because you know cheap wine can be pretty nasty apparently honestly i've doug i've never had cheap wine that i can think of i don't drink wine that much but maybe i have and i'm just like well that was nasty yeah well all wine is nasty but from what i'm told cheap wine is even worse (laughs) (laughs) i think that's all i've ever drank was cheap wine so uh maybe that's why i never was a we never did go in for the wine but I, i i'm pretty sure that's how it was fred that there were these two types of, of wine. And, um, and so from that, I just want to address a couple fairly common teachings, um, at least among, among churches, Fred, where people actually read the Bible. Um, and, and these two common teachings are, number one, that Jesus could not have made alcoholic wine at the wedding in Cana. That's number one. And number two, that the wine involved in the Lord's Supper could not have been fermented and still represent the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'll try to give a brief synopsis for anyone not familiar. So, And I know there's tons of pages, Doug, and millions of hours of Bible studies on this. There's so much been talked about. It's contentious. So we're just going to focus on the alcohol content. And for, for now, not so much the theological content. Okay. Okay. okay, so the water into wine at the wedding in Cana of Galilee was Jesus' first miracle recorded in the Bible. That's pretty well known, you know, by, by most that kind of have a, a rudimentary knowledge of the Bible. And we know from the text of the Gospels that they had run out of wine and that Jesus right. had them gather water. And this first miracle in the Bible was when he served it to the host that had miraculously changed into wine. Right, right. And and so the fundamentalist, the conservative pastor, he might say there's no way that a holy God would serve alcohol to a bunch of people who'd already been drinking enough to have run the host out of wine. And so the wine Jesus made, he must have it must have actually been grape juice. It didn't have any alcohol, it didn't have time to ferment. And it's only called wine in the Bible because in the Bible all grape juice is called wine. It's all called wine. Okay, so that's that one perspective from, you know, certain theologians on the miracle of water to wine. So what about the Lord's Supper, Doug? Right, well, it's been said that the wine in the Lord's Supper couldn't have been fermented because uh, the bread representing his body was unleavened, meaning it was free of corruption. You know, leaven or yeast produces decomposition, and it's a symbol of corruption in the Bible, right, in Matthew 16, 6. Jesus said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And so the implication is that fermentation is is actual corruption and symbolic corruption. And and, and it gets people drunk, which God commands against. And so alcohol could not have been present in the wine that Jesus either made or drank. Yeah, so that's their viewpoint. And it's interesting because you always have to consider all of Scripture so as it turns out, leaven is, while it is often used to symbolize corruption, leaven is also used as a metaphor for influence and growth for good. So for example, Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven to leaven in Matthew 13, verse 33, where he said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Okay, good point, Fred. Good point. And that proves, you know, one should not build a doctrine on proof texts. The Bible is not a loose leaf pile of proof texts for this or that theological position. The Bible is a big whole book that we should try to 
the, one of the goals in our life should be to try to understand the whole book. And, and Fred, I think we'll see as we survey the biblical treatment of drinking alcohol that there are verses you can take out to make points on whatever side you prefer if, you're, if mm-hmm. you're trying to just grab proof text. But an understanding of the whole scriptural picture is necessary to understand God's commands about drinking alcohol for specific people um, and, and at specific times in history. So let's, let's look at this, uh, again, uh, uh, this idea from Dr. A's paper from, uh, and, and from fr- fundamentalist preachers. And by the way, I love fundamentalist preachers. I love them and I respect them and I've learned a great deal from them. Um, but let's look at this likelihood that the Bible could refer to both fermented and unfermented wine and which ones were involved in, in the activities of Jesus. Isaiah 65 eight implies that unfermented grape juice can indeed be called wine. Because uh, Isaiah 65, 8 says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. Okay, so there it's saying wine, and it's, it's actually still in the grape. So the Bible can refer to unfermented grape juice as wine. Um, and as I said earlier, the Bible speaks of wine and strong drink as two separate things, but often in conjunction with one another, especially when uh, referencing wickedness, Fred. Uh, Leviticus 10.9, God commands the priests, do not drink wine nor strong drink when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. Talk of, Now that's a pretty serious command. Yep. And then also Leviticus 6.3. Leviticus 6.3 includes a command for the priest against vinegar, Fred. And, and vinegar, interestingly, is created by converting ethanol, including wine, into acetic acid by fermentation. And as such, there are traces of alcohol in vinegar, but a very small amount. So so this inclusion of vinegar for the priests, no vinegar, no wine, would indicate in the Bible there is a symbolic status of any alcohol as corrupt. So if you want to go in the Bible and find a verse that indicates any alcohol is corrupt. Well, there you go. There is verses. There's a verse that indicates that, um, at least for the mm-hmm. Levitical priesthood, yeah. um, and at least at least when they entered the tabernacle, right? Um, and th- and that's what's that's what the proof texters leave out. They tend to leave out the context of the proof text. And so, so let's just continue. De- Deuteronomy twenty nine six. God tells the Hebrews after their sojourn in the wilderness, he says, you have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk strong, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. So here, uh, leavened bread is presented alongside wine and strong drink. He's saying they didn't have any of that. So uh, making a further symbolic case for alcohol and leaven being symbolic of Corruption, but Fred, does that mean that they're always unacceptable corruption? That's and what that's we have a good to ask. Question. And to know yeah. that, we have to read more of the Bible. Deuteronomy fourteen twenty four um, is one of the sections, uh, Fred, on the tithe commandment to Israel. In this section, God commands the Hebrews to bring a tithe of all their increase of the fruit of the of the ground to Jerusalem. Unless, he says, unless, quote, the place be too far from thee, unquote, meaning to carry the actual goods, but too far for you to actually carry the produce to Jerusalem, God says, then shalt thou turn your tithe into money, go unto the place that God chooses, that's Jerusalem, and bestow that money for whatever thy soul lusteth after, whether oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God. So is it always unacceptable corruption? So, Doug, wait a minute now. So we can eat our tithe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I was actually aware of this because of a Bible study that Bob has, and you can get it out at rsr.org slash store. Yeah. And it's uh, and it's also over at Theology Thursday titled To Tithe or Not to Tithe. And I love mm-hmm. what Dominic Inyard said. He said, most churches say that we are not under the law except the part where it says you have to give us money. <laughs> so uh-huh, that's right. My, my future son-in-law, I mentioned to him about how you, you know, this thing on tithing and 10%, you know, uh, 
Did you know that once a year you can eat your tithe? You don't have to give it to the church. And he was surprised <laughs> about that. So I played that Bible study for him on our way up to Estes Park one time. And uh, yeah, that one's not going to sit well, Doug, with the uh, prosperity preachers. Um, and again, for even mm-hmm. the typical pastor for that matter. But anyways, right. yeah, once a year we're allowed to eat our tithe. Yeah, well, well not, not even that, Fred. In fact, doing this research, uh, uh, I did some Bible study that I haven't done before. And so we were not even going to get into the fact that the tithe was only commanded once a year, Fred. And it was not commanded every pay period. And it was only for produce. It was not for money at all. So, But we're not even going to start getting into that okay. if you want to upset. <laughs> but So we don't want to get too far afield, Fred. Back to alcohol and wine, okay. specifically in the Bible. Um, Psalm 104.15 says, the Lord causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man. So my question, Fred, does non-alcoholic wine make a man's heart glad? <laughs> I suppose if you're thirsty, Doug, you know, grape juice. I don't, yeah. So I think that's a great argument. I mean, what maketh glad the heart of man? That does sound like a little bit of alcohol there, to be honest. (laughs) Yeah, but I I hear you, Fred, though. If you're really, really thirsty, shot of grape juice, yeah, I probably would make your heart glad. So again, you've got to know the context. To Take that verse. You could go either way with it. But let's look at more scripture, because if we look at enough scripture, Fred, we, God will give us the answer. He promises us that. that he, mm-hmm. if, if we want to know the truth and we're willing to look in His Word, He will show us. So Judges yes. 13.4. Uh, Judges 13.4, when God prophesied to Manoah's wife regarding the birth of Samson, He told her, quote, Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. Yeah, that's interesting. So Doug... Uh, Dominic and I mentioned that in our show on science in the Bible, and that this is wisdom before its time. On the devastating impact of consuming alcohol when you're pregnant, it's called fetal alcohol syndrome, and you don't mm-hmm. want to drink any alcohol. You know, there's this myth that you can have a little bit of champagne. Well, guess what? Champagne has alcohol in it. It has ethanol. You don't want any ethanol in your system, and that's why God said, do not drink wine or strong drink, which means alcohol. And eat in any right. unclean thing if you're pregnant. So again, yes, wisdom yes. before its time in the Bible. But the legalistic pastor will say, "See, when God wants you to be especially holy, He says no alcohol." So, uh, but but let's let's move on through the Scripture. Proverbs twenty verse one says, "Wine is a mocker, and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise." So, Fred, this implies wine and strong drink can both deceive, implying that the wine discussed here, I mean, it might be the cheap stuff, but it's still alcoholic. So the Bible puts them both together. Wine and strong drink can can deceive. And and again, Fred, if you notice a pattern, the Bible seems to be, uh, it's mentioning wine and strong drink, but it's admonishing against being deceived, which implies drunkenness. It implies... So the admonition is against drunkenness. Proverbs 31, 4. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So, Fred, is this a command for kings and princes not to drink at all if they want to be especially holy? Or is this, is this a comment upon what men do, including kings and princes, uh, regardless of God's advice? And God's advice, by the way, is that the best of men avoid wine and strong drink, avoid drinking wine and strong drinks to forget that uh, to the point where you forget the law and and it uh, perverts your judgment. And so I'll just ask you, Fred, is this a command not to drink at all or a general admonition against drunkenness? Yeah, we know what the Bible says about drunkenness. Obviously, that's a sin. And it's interesting, if you continue reading Proverbs chapter 31 and go to verse 6 and 7, it says, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. And this isn't a command of total abstinence. 
Well, right, right there in the same verse, <laughs> right there, or yep. right there in the same section. Yeah, yeah, good point, yep. Fred. And, and then, and then, Fred, uh, we have the book of Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah spends almost the entire sixty-six chapters of his book condemning Israel and foretelling their captivity. And there's just a few brief interludes of other prophecies. It's mostly just it's hellfire and damnation preaching from from Isaiah. And let's see what he says about alcohol in five eleven. The prophet warns against those who go early in the morning to follow strong drink. And then in 5.22, Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. And Isaiah 28.7, But they have also erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. And in 56.12, Regarding those who are in rebellion against God, Isaiah says, Come ye, they say. I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. And and, and Isaiah warns of, through the whole book, he warns of and uses drunkenness as a pejorative description of Israel and as a reason for God's wrath against them. And Doug, in Luke chapter 1, verse 15, the angel prophesies of John the Baptist's birth and tells Elizabeth and Zacharias, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. So here a prophet, similar to priests entering the tabernacle, is set apart to never drink alcohol. So these were men set apart by God as priests and prophets who were commanded not to drink wine at times or for life. Basically. Right, Fred. And so the question is, the question becomes, is God's commandment for abstinence um, for these particular priests, does that mean that the fundamentalist pastor insisting on abstinence from the pulpit, is he also calling men to special holiness? Hmm. Uh, Or, Fred, is it a fleshly fleshly effort to puff people up, to be count yourselves among the prophets. Or even worse, Fred, is the pastor from the pulpit who insists on commanding total abstinence, is he putting himself in the place of God? So we have to be careful because there are, if you read the whole Bible, there are many, many more prophets for whom the admonition against alcohol was not given than the prophets for whom it was given. And, and Fred, Jesus, we know drank wine. We know yeah. it. Now, whether it, yeah. was, whether it was fermented or not, or contained just traces of alcohol, you know, like the, like the, like the vinegar that he was given on the cross, right? Uh, whether alcohol content aside, we know that Jesus drank some wine. And it's from Jesus, not surprisingly, that we find one of the most enlightening passages in the scripture regarding drinking alcohol. In Luke chapter 7, verse 33... Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees and the lawyers regarding their hypocrisy, their hypocrisy toward both him and toward John the Baptist, both of whom they rejected, by the way. And Jesus said of the Pharisees and the lawyers, he said, quote, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say he hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking. And ye say, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber. So Jesus is stating that he drank wine. And at the same time, he's mocking their accusation that he was a drunkard. So we know that Jesus never bore false witness. We know that. So based on this statement that Jesus made, we know that he drank wine. And his reference to their accusation of drunkenness proves he was never drunk. But it does imply, Fred, that the wine had some alcoholic content. Hence, he could turn their rejection of him based on this false accusation. He was able to turn that back on them. And so, Fred, all the scripture we've covered, out of all of it, this to me is the most revealing so far regarding God's attitude toward alcohol and drunkenness specifically. Yeah, and this brings us to what I find is a really straightforward instruction from the Apostle Paul. And this comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. And he said, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, 
wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The Apostle Paul does not command abstinence, uh, although he does command, don't get drunk. And so, Fred, that's a good verse to wrap this up on. Instead of getting off in the weeds and going back and mincing words and finding proof texts and hashing through the Hebrew and the Greek or trying to guess a, a dozen different cultural factors and religious instructions at various times during the writing of the Bible, we could just go to Paul. Just go yep. to Paul, who, who, who was instructed and sent by Jesus Christ himself with instructions on everything we need to be equipped and to function as a believer in the body of Christ. And so with that in mind, Fred, I'm convinced that the Scripture shows that Jesus could eat leavened bread and he could drink alcoholic wine without he himself or the symbol of the Lord's Supper being corrupted. And Jesus made good wine at the wedding mm-hmm. in Canaan, not the cheap stuff. Uh, and, he, and he made that wine without sinning. And he made that wine without tempting anyone there to sin. Um, Neither Paul nor the whole of Scripture demands total abstinence as a general command for us. And Paul quite clearly said, don't get drunk. Okay, Mm -hmm. that's pretty simple. And, And by the way, Fred, for some folks, that might mean they don't drink any alcohol at all. And that's totally fine. Yeah, and you know, there's certainly no command to be found anywhere in the Bible that says to drink. You know, hey, you must drink. Thou shalt no. drink. There, It's not there. And there are plenty of circumstances where God commanded, you know, in certain circumstances not to drink. Yeah. And so not drinking at all is not only okay, it's admirable, especially in a culture like ours, if you think about it, that practically worships all kinds of intoxication. And so, you know, mm. if a dad commands his kids that they abstain. I think he's right to do it. That's, you know, that's really good. Um, I just, I draw the line at anyone who says that all believers must abstain because that's just, uh, well, you know, wait, let's, uh, what Bob Bob Inyart used to say, they're being nicer than God. Oh, you know, they're, yeah. they're, yeah. So anytime we teach rules about holiness in the church that are unbiblical, that's just as bad as making rules to tolerate sin. I mean, because you get both extremes. Yeah, You exactly. get the super legalistic, and you get the ones that are say, hey, it's okay to sin, and they justify mm-hmm. all kinds of sinful behavior. You get both spectrums. Yeah, yeah they're both wrong, and, and too, too many biblically illiterate Christians, and, and, and too many of them are pastors, they think that erring on the side of their definition of righteousness with extra biblical regulation, they think that that'll produce more faith and more righteousness and and that it'll keep their flock from sin. But Paul tells us in the Bible that rules don't produce righteousness. Even the law, even God's law, which is holy, just, and good, let alone your rules. But Romans in Romans, Paul tells us that doesn't produce righteousness. He also tells us that men's rules placed over God's rules are evil. Uh, we learn that from Jesus himself in Mark chapter 7. And, and Paul tells us that only walking by faith in the Spirit produces, well, first salvation, he tells us in Ephesians 2, and then it produces holiness. You want to keep your flock from sin? Teach them how to walk by faith in the Spirit. That produces holiness. Paul tells us that in Galatians chapter 5. And, and thank God that Jesus Christ is going to show us all things, Fred, when we're when we're finally redeemed, body, soul, and spirit, we're going to know. All of our papers will be corrected, and we'll absolutely know the answers to all these things. And I like to remind everyone involved in discussing topics like this, including myself, um, at the redemption and at the judgment seat of Christ, all our papers are going to be corrected, and everybody will be shown what really, Fred, we're going to be shown what we should want to know now. We should want to know now more than winning any debate or making scoring any points or coming up with the, with the slam dunk proof text. What we should want to know is the righteousness of Christ and his perfect will for our lives so that Paul's admonition against being puffed up with knowledge, right? Paul warns us of that in 1 Corinthians. Um, we need to take that to heart and always put Christ's righteous will ahead of anything you're thinking about. 
And if you do that, you'll do well, Fred. Yeah, well, well put, Doug. So how do we put a bow around all of this? So we've talked about the science, and we've talked about what the Bible has to say about alcohol consumption. And, you know, after reading a lot on this subject, from a scientific viewpoint, I'm actually going to have to align myself with something Canada did. I, You know, I'm, it's tough for me to say that, but they, I think <laughs> they got something pretty close here, Doug, pretty close okay. to right. And what they did was they drastically lowered their alcohol drinking limits, you know, as follows. And this is from Canada's recommended guidelines for alcohol consumption. So they have it as this. So they say to limit yourself to one or two drinks per week, not per day as it used to be, per week. Limit yourself to one or two drinks per week. And this is what their website says. There's a continuum of risk associated with weekly alcohol use where the reek of harm is zero drinks per week. Not drinking has benefits such as better health and better sleep. Two standard drinks or less per week is what they recommend you be at that or under. You are likely to avoid alcohol-related consequences for yourself or others at this level. Three to six standard drinks per week. Your risk of developing several types of cancer, including breast and colon cancer, increases at this level. Then they have seven standard drinks or more per week, which is, as Dr. Huberman defined as the chronic drinker, and really the most, is very common in society. We all know people who fall in this category. Many listening fall in this category. Your risk of heart disease or stroke increases significantly at this level. Each additional standard drink radically, radically increases the risk of alcohol-related consequences. So there we have it, right from the Canucks themselves. So I, I love, you can tell this is a government report, Fred, because it says zero drinks per week instead of just zero drinks. But we'll, we'll leave that aside. Th these recommendations seem... They seem fair, fairly reasonable. So as promised, we're going to give RSR's recommended guidelines for alcohol consumption based on what we know from both science and, most importantly, the Bible. And so here they are, RSR's recommended guidelines on alcohol. And also, please let us know your thoughts on this by either emailing us or leaving comments on our video. We'll be sure to read all the comments on this topic. So number one. Try to limit any drinking to one or two per week. And if you have a drink, try to increase your intake of probiotics, folate, and B12. Number two, consider a little bit of red wine when you have an upset tummy. Or if you're in Flint, Michigan, and uh, you, know, you better you know, really increase the amount of wine. Um, provide strong drink to those who are perishing. Nothing wrong with that. And finally, number four, some wine is okay for those who are of heavy heart. Mm. Okay, so let, Doug, let's make sure we don't take that last one too far. Don't don't like create a fake heavy heart for yourself and say, right. "Oh, I'm I'm sad this morning. It's cloudy out. I live in Seattle, which was a huge mistake I ever moved here." And I, yeah, you know, it's just terrible. Therefore, I'm of heavy heart, and I'm going to just booze it up the rest of the day. So yeah, don't right, use heavy right. heart as a reason to. But it does no. say that you can have some wine is okay for those with a heavy heart. That's right. And, and so don't take Paul's advice to Timothy to take a little wine for your stomach's sake. Don't take that as a license to get drunk. That's uh, exactly. very simple, very simple, very straightforward, um, not legalistic, right from, it, it's, all about, uh, it's all about faith and honoring God with our body and uh, keeping, our, our, keeping the fact in mind that we are a purchased possession of His, and what He did for us is the most loving thing that could be done to give one's life, and just to uh, ponder that, believe that on a daily basis, get into His Word and read about it, and fall more and more in love with Him, and you won't want to abuse yourself, and you won't want to put others at risk by getting drunk. Yep. So again, we welcome your comments. Please let us know what you think. Uh, leave comments in the video or send us emails. We realize this is a contentious issue. There is a lot to go through, a lot of interesting science and uh, interesting perspectives from, a, from the biblical point of view. Uh, we appreciate you, with, appreciate you watching this uh, podcast or listening on the radio at KLTT in Denver, AM 670, 3 p.m. every Friday. Uh, we're proud to be on both radio and YouTube and our 
channel continues to grow, please subscribe if you haven't already. We've got much, much more content coming your way. A lot of great interviews coming up and other things that we think will, uh, you'll, you'll learn a lot more about science and the scripture and how, how those two play together. Uh, there's so much cool stuff that we do at Real Science Radio. So, for Doug Amen. McBurney, I'm Fred Williams of Real Science Radio. May God bless you.